some more great aerial footage courtesy of Greg. Appreciate that clip and let's head to that surface map. We've had a powerful Rocky Mountain system emerge into the Great Plains yesterday. Numerous storms in Texas and Oklahoma and that system has moved out into the lower Mississippi River Valley. Two distinct squall lines, one moving into Georgia at this hour, the other crossing through Mississippi. Some meager indications of severe weather, slight risk in Mississippi with that westernmost squall line and a slight risk up there around Indianapolis, South Bend, Fort Wayne, and Chicago. Yesterday, that was a marginal area, so they've upgraded it a little bit overnight. And just a small 5% chance of tornadoes in those two areas. We certainly have an unseasonably strong burst of cold air coming through the central plains. Temperatures down into the upper 40s and lower 50s at this hour. Now that is kind of localized because as you go north, we pick up 70s once again. This isn't going to have a huge effect on the eastern U.S., but it will cool things down as it makes its way into the Midwest. Temperatures in the wake of that system, strong cold air advection drop in temperatures down into the upper 60s at this hour at Dallas, Tyler, and Abilene. We head out west a little bit, starting to look more like late spring in Arizona and California, and temperatures up to 86 there at Sacramento at this hour. Up to the north, another strong system moving into the northwestern U.S. There it is. Looking at 58 at Seattle right now. And we've got the seclusion running through the Fraser River Valley into the Columbia River Basin. Up to the north, Alaska is warming up a little bit into the 50s. Still a bit on the cold side. And we've got this quasi-stationary front near the Brooks Range, which has been there for about two or three weeks. Up in northern Canada, there's been a very strong Hudson Bay pattern, Hudson Bay vortex. So temperatures well below freezing, lots of snow coming all the way down into Quebec and Labrador. And there we pick up an outgoing system in Labrador and Newfoundland. Then returning to the northeastern U.S., this is all a transitional air mass. Temperatures mostly in the 60s, except that localized cooling where we've had strong wet bulbing and adiabatic lift. That's cooled that part of the air mass down. And then in the eastern U.S., we've got this area of damned cold air. Now, I'm not saying damn cold air. I'm talking about damming of cold air against the Appalachians right there. Temperatures rather cool. We've got northeasterly flow marginal VFR ceilings, and fog when you get into Virginia. So that's characteristic weather for that kind of front. You can kind of see how the warm air makes its way easily into the Midwest, but not quite so around the Appalachians. It's kind of stuck, and that's what keeps that cold air lodged right in that area. And that type of front was actually a major factor in the development of the ADA model, which followed the NGM back in the 90s. The ADA model, of course, was replaced about 20 years ago with the WRF, which is also known as the NAM at INSEP. And for those of you wondering about this little break in the front, that's accidental. That's just an editing mistake, so don't worry about that. The front is okay. Don't need to worry about that. It's not broken. Checking in on Big Rig Steve. Once again, no video. Looks like he's on break. And let's just run through the temperature records real quick. This afternoon, it is going to be a hot one in the San Joaquin Valley, looking at 102 for Sacramento and 103 for Fresno. For tomorrow, it looks like some relief, but maybe the heat working eastward. 91 at Salt Lake City. Meanwhile, the cool air from the Central Plains moves into Texas, and we start out the morning at 51 at Wichita Falls, 57 at Austin. For Friday, it looks like the heat 
which is manifested by the upper level ridging, moves into Colorado, coming up to 92 there at Grand Junction. And then by Saturday, the panhandles going up over 100 degrees. So it looks like that ridging is moving eastward at about 10 miles an hour, which is about 240 miles per day. For Sunday, we can see that heat settling in once again across West Texas, 104 at Childress. No records indicated for Monday. However, this is interesting. The last day of May on Tuesday, some 90s starting to appear in the Great Lakes region. Of course, back on Friday, a bit of a surprise event with the Gaylord Tornado in Michigan. EF3 Tornado did catastrophic damage in that town. Let's take a look at that. So starting out, we're looking at northern Michigan, and coincidentally, the Gaylord Radar located right there. There's a weather service office in that same town. We see this line of thunderstorms leaving the Green Bay area and crossing Lake Michigan. And as we get closer to the radar, the storms look pretty intense. Special marine warnings issued, and then the severe warnings come up. So one more look at that, and then we'll switch over to the second half. And that puts us at 2.30 p.m. Central. Running the second half of the animation, that's the cell that we want to watch. And as it moves east-northeast, we can see it take on a definite supercell characteristic. Looks very much like what we see in the plains. And there it goes, heading into the Gaylord area. You can see the warning come up for that storm. And it moves on off into northeastern Michigan, retaining its supercell structure. Let's take a closer look at that storm. There you go. You can see the road overlays. There's the town of Gaylord and the hook echo. Tornado right in there. And that moves northeast. And you can see it cross right over that town. There's the debris ball or the tornadic debris signature. That's going to be it right there. We need to factor in the storm motion since it is definitely very fast moving. We'll back that up. And we really need to zoom in. But that's that couplet right there. You can see the strong outbounds and the strong inbounds. That's given us that rotational signature that we see right there west of the town. So let's run that through one more time. The couplet goes right into the west part of Gaylord. And then it seems to weaken as it gets northeast of the town. And here's the rest of the images I have. Definitely retains its supercellular structure as it heads out into Lake Huron. And that's about all the images I have for that storm. There's the SPC storm reports, and you can see how isolated that tornado report was. Just two tornado reports within five minutes of each other, and one other one in New Jersey, and that was it for the day. Let's return back to the present and take a look at the upper air patterns. Now, right now, we have kind of a zonal pattern. So that is what we have right at this hour, right now. Zonal flow across the northern states. Strong Hudson Bay vortex. Can't see that too well, but that effect has been kind of minimized a little bit over the past few days. And then to the south, cutoff low across Oklahoma, causing numerous showers in that region. Out to the west, ridging in the Great Basin region, and all of that will gradually progress eastward over the weekend. There's tomorrow afternoon. Cut off low in Missouri, the ridging working into the central plains, so the chance for thunderstorms will be shut down over the weekend. We bring that forward all the way into Monday. Cyclonic flow setting up on the west coast with increasing westerlies, and that will really take hold by midweek and bring fast flow, 80, 90 knot winds into the central plains. So chances for storms, especially in this area, will really be going up. Most of the thrust of that strong 
Storm track will be heading into the Great Lakes region. So we're not going to see much of that in Texas and Oklahoma. It will be kind of summer-like. And you can see back there around the 30th and 31st, there was that hint of an upper level high across Indiana. And that means probably a bit of a heat wave through here. But one kind of weird flow that we've got set up right there is easterlies across the southeastern U.S. And that's something that we tend to see mostly in August. So the pattern there may be kind of August-like. Anyway, by the 4th, 5th of June, the patterns become more normal. Some stronger flow coming into Oklahoma and Texas. However, Hudson Bay Vortex still in place and continuing to bring that cold air southward. And as we move into summer, this is getting to be a very common pattern, especially in the western U.S. A drought in place, and that extends all the way into West Texas and the San Antonio Corpus Christi area. And of course, we do have storms going on in Mississippi. As we mentioned earlier, only a severe thunderstorm watch box out for that. However, severe thunderstorm watches always carry the possibility for isolated tornadoes. And that could be the case down here. It looks like a radar indicated tornado near Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, as we record this. So that's going to be in effect for Kiln, Mississippi. There's a closer look at that with the Slidell radar. That is a bow echo. Moving northeast, and the tornado worn cell is on the southern periphery of that bow. The base velocity is showing lots of outbound due to the strong forward motion. And of course, that's why we have to use storm relative velocity. So here I've selected 230 at 30 knots. And that's probably the couplet right there. You do have to sometimes go up to higher tilts to see what's going on. But so far, the circulation looks weak. If we run that back a little bit, the couplet was definitely stronger at the time they issued that warning. So that's going to be 30 out and 30 in, 60 knots of shear, with a diameter of two miles, and that's certainly going to be of some concern. And that's the normalized rotation product, and that's going to be the reflectivity. So that's a little bitty hook coming out of that main cell. And that's all for this edition of Forecast Lab. Thank you for joining, and hopefully we'll see you back here on Friday. Have a good one. Bye-bye.